this way. This is God's right. And now we get also with Smith coming along, he says it's not only God's, I mean, he's not saying this, but this is what's happening philosophically in principle. He's saying it's not only a question of private property. That's all now presupposed as given. And that there's money investors that buy labor given. That there's no limit to how much they can buy of other men's labor, how much they can accumulate, how much inequality. That's all given now. And so he comes along, and what his big idea is, and again, it's just introduced in, in parentheses on, on passant. You know, when people put out the, the goods for sale and others, you know, the supply and other people buy them with the, the demand and so forth, how do, you, how do we have supply equaling demand or demand equaling supply? How can they come into equilibrium? And that is one of the central notions of economics is how do they come into equilibrium? And he says, it's the invisible hand of the market that brings them into equilibrium. So now we have God is actually imminent. He just didn't give the rights to property and how, uh, you know, all its wherewithal and uh, its natural rights of uh, doing all that Locke said. Now we have the system itself as God. In fact, Smith says, when he talks, and you'll never find this quote again, you have to read the whole of the uh, inquiry into the wealth of nations. He says, the scantiness of subsistence sets limits to the reproduction of the poor, and that uh, nature can deal with this in no other uh, way than elimination of their children. So he anticipated evolutionary theory in the worst sense. Uh, apply. He, this is well before Darwin. And so he, he called them the race of laborers. So you can see there was inherent racism built in here. There was an ex inherent acceptance, life blindness to kill in innumerable children. And he thought, well, that's the invisible hand making supply meet demand and demand meet supply. So see what, how wise God is. So you can see a lot of the really virulent, life destructive, eco-genocidal things that are going on now have, uh, in a way, a thought gene uh, back in Smith, too. When we reflect on the original concept of so-called free market capitalist system, as initiated by early economic philosophers such as Adam Smith, we see that the original intent of a market was based around real, tangible, life-supporting goods for trade. Adam Smith never fathomed that the most profitable economic sector on the planet would eventually be in the arena of financial trading or so-called investment, where money itself is simply gained by the movement of other money in an arbitrary game which holds zero productive merit to society. Yet, regardless of Smith's intent, the door for such seemingly anomalous advents was left wide open by one fundamental tenet of this theory. Money is treated as a commodity in and of itself. Today in every economy of the world, regardless of the social system they claim, money is pursued for the sake of money and nothing else. The underlying idea, which was mysteriously qualified by Adam Smith with his religious declaration of the invisible hand, is that the narrow, self-interested pursuit of this fictional commodity will somehow magically manifest human and social well-being and progress. The reality is that the monetary incentive interest, or what some have termed the money sequence of value, has now completely decoupled from the foundational life interest, which could be termed the life sequence of value. What has happened is that there's a complete confusion in economic doctrine uh, between those two sequences. They think that the money sequence of value delivers the life sequence of value, that, and that's why they say if more goods are sold, if GDPs rise and so forth, therefore there will be more well-being, enhanced well-being. We take the GDP to be a basic layer indicator of social health. Well, there you see the confusion. It's talking about money sequences of value, that is all the receipts, all the revenues that are derived from selling uh, goods, uh, and they're confusing that 
with uh, life reproduction so that you have built right into this thing from the beginning is a complete conflation of the money and life sequences of value. So we're dealing with a kind of a structured delusion that becomes more and more deadly as the money sequence decouples from producing anything at all. So it's a system disorder and the system disorder seems to be fatal. In society today, you seldom hear anyone speak of the progress of their country or society in terms of their physical well-being, state of happiness, trust, or social stability. Rather, the measures are presented to us through economic abstractions. We have the gross domestic product, the consumer price index, the value of the stock market, rates of inflation, and so on. But does this tell us anything of real value as to the quality of people's lives? No, all these measures have to do with the money sequence itself and nothing more. For example, the gross domestic product of a country is a measure of the value of goods and services sold. This measure is claimed to correlate to the standard of living of a country's people. In the United States, health care accounted for over 17% of GDP in 2009, amounting to over 2.5 trillion spent hence creating a positive effect on this economic measure. And, based on this logic, it would be even better for the U.S. economy if healthcare services increased more so, perhaps to $3 trillion or $5 trillion, since that would create more growth, more jobs, and hence boasted by economists as a rise in their country's standard of living. But, wait a minute, what do healthcare services actually represent? Well, sick and dying people. That's right, the more unhealthy people there are in America, the better the economy. Now, that is not an exaggeration or a cynical perspective. In fact, if we step back far enough, you will realize that the GDP not only doesn't reflect real public or social health on any tangible level, it is, in fact, mostly a measure of industrial inefficiency and social degradation. And the more you see it rise, the worse things are becoming with respect to personal, social and environmental integrity. You have to create problems to create profit. There is no profit under the current paradigm uh, in saving lives, putting balance on this planet, having justice uh, and peace or anything else. There's just no profit there. There's an old saying, pass a law, create a business. Whether you're creating a business for a lawyer or whatever. So, you know, crime does create business, just like destruction creates, creates business in Haiti. We have now roughly two million people in, incarcerated in this country, and of those, many of them are in prisons run by private corporations, Corrections Corporation of America, Wackenhut, who trade their stock on Wall Street based upon how many people are in jail. Now that's sickness, but that is a reflection of what this economic paradigm calls for. So what exactly does this economic paradigm call for? What is it that keeps our economic system going? Consumption. Or more accurately, cyclical consumption. When we break down the foundation of classic market economics, we are left with a pattern of monetary exchange that simply cannot be allowed to stop or even substantially slowed if the society as we know it is to remain operational. There are three main actors on the economic stage the employee, the employer, and the consumer. The employee sells labor to the employer for income. The employer sells its production services and hence goods to the consumer for income. And the consumer, of course, is simply another role of the employer and employee, spending back into the system to enable the cyclical consumption to continue. In other words, the global market system is based on the assumption that there will always be enough product demand in society to move enough money around at a rate which can keep the consumption process going. And the faster the rate of consumption, the more so-called economic growth is assumed, and so the machine goes. But hold on, I thought an economy was meant to, I don't know, economize? Doesn't the very term have to do with preservation and efficiency and a reduction of waste? So how does our system which demands consumption and the more the better efficiently preserve or economize at all? Well, it doesn't. The intent of the market system is in fact the exact opposite 
of what a real economy is supposed to do, which is efficiently and conservatively orient the materials for production and distribution of life-supporting goods. We live on a finite planet with finite resources, where, for example, the oil we utilize took millions of years to develop, where the minerals we use took billions of years to develop. So, having a system that deliberately promotes the acceleration of consumption for the sake of so-called economic growth is pure ecocidal insanity. Absence of waste, that's what efficiency is. Absence of waste. This system is more wasteful than all the other existing systems in the history of the planet. Every level of life organization and life system is in a state of crisis and challenge and decay or collapse. No peer-reviewed journal in the last 30 years uh, will tell you anything different. That is that every life system is in decline as well as social programs, as well as our water access. Try to name any means of life that isn't threatened and in danger. You can't. There, isn't, there really isn't one, and that's very, very despairing. But we haven't even figured out the causal mechanism. We don't want to face the causal mechanism. We just want to go on, you know, that's what insanity is, where you keep doing the same thing over and over again, though it clearly doesn't work. So you're really dealing with not an economic system, but I would go so far as to say an anti-economic system. There's an old saying that the competitive market model seeks to create the best possible goods at the lowest possible prices. This statement is essentially the incentive concept which justifies market competition based on the assumption that the result is the production of higher quality goods. If I was going to build myself a table from scratch, I would naturally build it out of the best, most durable materials possible, right? With the intent for it to last as long as possible. Why would I want to make something poor, knowing I would have to eventually do it again and expend more materials and more energy? Well, as rational as that may seem in the physical world, when it comes to the market world, it is not only explicitly irrational, it is not even an option. It is technically impossible to produce the best of anything if a company is to maintain a competitive edge and hence remain affordable to the consumer. Literally everything created and set for sale in the global economy is immediately inferior the moment it is produced, for it is a mathematical impossibility to make the most scientifically advanced, efficient and strategically sustainable products. This is due to the fact that the market system requires that cost efficiency or the need to reduce expenses exist at every stage of production from the cost of labor to the cost of materials and packaging and so on. This competitive strategy of course is to make sure the public buys their goods rather than from a competing producer which is doing the exact same thing to also make their goods both competitive and affordable. This immutably wasteful consequence of the system could be termed intrinsic obsolescence. However, this is only one part of a larger problem. A fundamental governing principle of market economics, one that you will not find in any textbook, by the way, is the following. Nothing produced can be allowed to maintain a lifespan longer than what can be endured in order to continue cyclical consumption. In other words, it is critical that stuff break down, fail, and expire within a certain amount of time. This is termed planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence is the backbone of the underlying market strategy of every goods producing corporation in existence. While very few, of course, would admit to such a strategy outright, what they do is mask it within the intrinsic obsolescence phenomenon just discussed, while often ignoring or even suppressing new advents in technology which might create a more sustainable, durable good. So, if it wasn't wasteful enough that the system inherently cannot allow the most durable and efficient goods to be produced, planned obsolescence deliberately recognizes that the longer any good is in operation, the worse it is for sustaining cyclical consumption and hence the market system itself. In other words, product sustainability is actually inverse to economic growth and hence there is a direct reinforced incentive to make sure lifespans are short of any given good produced. And in fact, the system cannot operate any other way.
One glance at the sea of landfills now spreading across the world show the obsolescence reality. There are now billions of cheaply made cell phones, computers and other technology, each full of precious, difficult to mine materials such as gold, coltan, copper, now rotting in vast piles, usually due to the mere malfunction or obsolescence of small parts, which, in a conservative society, could likely be fixed or updated.